He wants to reproduce his character in us. So that we can make it to heaven or become a relevant person for him. Nineteen, wilt thou never turn thy, God, thy gaze away from me, nor, let, nor leave me alone until I swallow my spittle? Have I sinned? What have I done to thee, O watcher of men? Why hast thou set me as thy target, so that I am a burden even to myself? Twenty-one, why then dost thou not pardon my transgression, and take away my iniquity. For now I will lie down in the dust, and thou will seek me, but I will not be. Because I've just expired. I've just not been able to handle other things that you've thrown at me. Have any of you ever felt that way at some point in your life? No. And that is why it's important for us to understand the gospel aspect of what we're studying here in the book of Job. It's not about us. It's about how we are be going to become relevant for Christ. When you and I believe from the heart, not intellectually, because we know all the politically correct answers, we know all the political correct answers. We know our Bibles off. But do you believe that God knows the beginning of everything all the way to the end of everything? Yes. yes. Then you will understand and hopefully appreciate what Mary Jane mentioned a moment ago. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Who would like to read that for us? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Thank you. Everyone hear that? These things, all of these things are recorded for whose admonition? Our for a reason. Upon whom the ends of the earth has come. Or will come. But they cannot come until we recognize that God needs me to be relevant for Him. If you ask most Christians, well, what are you, what are you doing? What, you know, what's the primary thing in your life? What is the focus of your life? I'm waiting for Jesus to come. What? My Bible says that Jesus is waiting for me to get my act together with Him. To make me relevant for Him. Because that's the only way that He can prove to Satan, who accuses us how frequently? Always. Revelation 12, 10, day and night. Satan says to Jesus, you're going to take this guy to heaven? You can't be serious. Why does he say that? Because he's concerned about me not making it to heaven? Yeah. And he wants to be taken to heaven. He wants to be pardoned. And as long as he can get, Satan can get me to focus on poor little me, it's impossible for me to focus on terrific Jesus. So, Jesus is waiting for me to let him make me relevant for him. Why? Because he would like to bring an end to life on this earth as we know it today. But he needs my cooperation. And I'm never going to give him my cooperation until I understand the next, skip verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 10, now read verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Who would like to read 1 Corinthians 10, 13? 
Let me paraphrase it for you. No temptation has or ever will overtake you that is not known to man. What does no temptation not include? Everything. No temptation has or ever will overtake you that is not known to man. Why? Because God is faithful. Who? God. God is faithful. And God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to endure. Do you like that so far? Well, that's a wonderful thought. But how is it going to happen? And will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure everything that I, God, allow Satan to bring on you. That is what God is trying to convince our brother Job of. Job doesn't understand that all of these things that we learn, that God gave permission for Satan, the adversary, in Job chapter 1, verse 8, to do to Job, was the ultimate compliment. God says, this member of the human race is now ready for your best shot, see? What a privilege. What an honor. If we understand what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says. No temptation has or ever will overtake you that is not known to man. Because God is faithful. And God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. And with the temptation that God permits Satan to bring on you, God will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. I have never suggested that anyone memorize this scripture. But if you ever choose to, this is the one. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Until you understand that intellectually and accept it from the heart, you're going to keep having bad days from time to time. That's Satan's job to make sure that we have bad days. I study with people on the internet, sometimes on Skype, and I get some very interesting calls sometimes. Say, Chuck, I'm really going through it, blah, 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 and then they just give you a list of all the bad things that they're going through. And when they get through, they say, well, are you there? I say, yeah, you're not listening. And so I said, what kind of condition are you in? Well, I'm beat down. I feel like Joe. There's nothing left. And I say, well, that's a problem. You're not dead yet. <laughs> you're still wiggling. <laughs> you haven't died yet. That's why you're having problems. And then they get into, you know you're right. I forgot about that. Did Jesus feel forsaken hanging on the cross? Yes. yes. Who would like to read for us Luke 23, 46? Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Did Jesus forget 1 Corinthians 10, 13? Why have you forsaken me? No, but for the first time in his life, he experienced God's presence being withdrawn. The Holy Spirit was there, but God was now withdrawing his presence from him. And that's why he felt forsaken. But he never lost focus, did he? Had he lost focus, he wouldn't have said, into what? We reconsidered. I was studying this with a minister 
that gets paid from the tithe that I pay. And uh, this was a Bible study with other people there. And uh, I read this passage. This is from the chapter in Desire of Ages titled Calvary. And I'm going to read the last sentence of the first paragraph and then the second paragraph. The last sentence of the first paragraph, page 753, the chapter Calvary in Desire of Ages. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. When I saw the little promos of the movie uh, The Passion by Mel Gibson years ago, people would say, Chuck, you've got to go see this. And I said, really? Why? Have you seen the little snippets on television encouraging me to go see the movie? And they said, yeah, that's where you need to go see it. I said, but that's unbiblical. It's 100% unbiblical. They're focusing on the physical pain. All the bleeding and the sweating and all of that. That's unbiblical. Why do you think that they crucified people in those days? Because it was the most humiliating way to kill a human being and the longest lasting way of killing a human being. But Jesus, <laughs> from the time that he was put on the cross to the time that he died, was about three hours, maybe a little bit more. So the purpose for crucifying a person was completely lost. Why? Let me continue to read. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Do you realize what that means? Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a sense of sin, bringing the Father's wrath from Him as man's substitute that made the cup He drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So what killed Jesus? A broken heart? He had no assurance that He would come forth from the tomb. Think about that. So what did he go through? Because he loved you more than he loved himself. Mm -hmm. And until you and I, and I understand that motivation, we are never going to allow God to make us relevant for him. Relevant for him, not to him. Jesus coming to this earth proves that he's relevant. That we're relevant to him. But now the question is, am I going to allow myself to become relevant for God? That is the issue. Do you understand the significance of this? There is no reason for you to dedicate your life, surrender your life to Jesus until you understand and appreciate 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 13. Why in the world would you want to surrender yourself to someone that you don't believe dealt with the realities of life with the same equipment that you have? That's what we're being taught today. At the Incarnation, Jesus only took on our innocent infirmities. Now that's a direct quote. And innocent infirmities, according to the scholars today, are... He got sleepy, hungry, and thirsty. That's what they describe as innocent infirmities. But the Bible is very clear. In Hebrews 2, 14 through uh, 18, and Galatians 4, 4 and 5, 
and Romans 8, 3. That in order to be made a merciful high priest, he had to be made in all things like me. Did that make him a sinner in performance? No. Upon his divinity, sinless divinity, he took on my sinful nature. In other words, he put his divinity in what? Neutral gear. Had he not, he wouldn't have qualified to redeem me. Not because I say so, but because Satan would have said, foul play, you come to redeem people, but with different equipment than they have to deal with reality. And that was a problem that Job had. He didn't understand that God was trying to make him relevant for God. He was focused on himself, which is natural. If you're not focused on there, who are you going to be focused on? Mary Jane, I have about what, four minutes? Chuck? Uh, I wanted to bring out something of when he was dying on the cross. Christ Would you stand up so that we can all hear you? When Christ was dying on the cross and he realized that the divine nature, divine presence had been pulled away, he had a moment where he felt, uh, what, what, what was this term, why have you forsaken me? But then he did realize, he knew his father's character, he knew what type of person he was, and he realized that he could trust. He realized that he put his whole faith in, Christ, in his father God. That's also an example for us. When the end time comes, Satan's going to do everything he can to make us believe that we're sinners not worthy of what Christ has done. But right there on the cross, he put his faith completely in his Father God. And we're to really understand that. And when that happens, we need to remember. We need to realize where our faith really should be lying. And it will be there. It won't be something that we should do or ought to do or must do. It will be done. Why? Right. We should be prepared before that happens, of course. Or God will not allow you to what? Right. Go be through tempted it. beyond what? Right. What you You're can able to endure. Right. It's the recipe that makes what you just described a reality. What is the recipe? No temptation has or ever will overtake you that is not known to man because... God is faithful, and God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. And with the temptation, God will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to bear anything that God gives Satan permission to bring into your life. That's the way the Greek says it. Over here. That's part of surrender. Yes. Why So what should my focus be? Well, I wonder if I can handle this. Well, I wonder if God is going to really put me through no. a situation like Job. No. Yeah, I, I wonder, you know, can I really handle this? That's what worrying means. I like what you said about faith in Christ or faith of Christ. Yeah. So this is the faith that we have to have. In this case of faith, we have to have faith of Christ. Yeah, that's what Paul is writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. It's not about us. That's the first one. I have what, five more minutes or I'm done? You got five more minutes. That's the issue. The question is, 
Do I trust God to do it? Remember 1 Corinthians 10 11? Why is this important? Because at some point in time, everything is going to come to an end. And you and I can decide, I'm going to be the generation that makes that choice to die to self. Amen. And now what does heaven say? We got a player here. I'm not being irreverent. We have someone here that is focused. What happens? All of heaven descends down on you. Now God does put a hedge around you. Remember Zechariah 2.5? You should look it up and read it. Beautiful passage. So once we become focused on being relevant for God, God says, that's all I'm asking. Now I will take over. And you will never intellectualize like Job is doing why things are happening to you. Why me? But you will say, as Paul did in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I still have a pulse. Yet not I, but Christ living in me. In the life which I now live, oh. I live by the faith of Jesus. If you're a creative person, there's two things that I beg you not to try to create. The first one is the wheel. Most of you arrived here on vehicles that had four wheels attached to them. That's been invented. The second thing I don't want for you to invent is faith. Jesus has already done that. And all he's asking you is to access a measure of faith that has been given to you. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. A measure of faith has been given to each one of us. Why? So that we can go out and say, wow, look at my faith. No. Look at the trust that I have in the faith of Jesus. And now I'm accessing it. Romans 12, 3. I'm sorry. I apologize. I was on 1 Corinthians 12. Forgive me. In my old age, I'm becoming dyslexic. Romans 12, 3. A measure of faith has been given to each one of us. And that's any time that you're dealing with anything, if you're dead, you're going to push the button. And you immediately are connected to Jesus' private office. And that's what Jesus is waiting. From the moment you awaken in the morning to you retire at night, Jesus is inviting you to spend the waking hours of each day in his private office. Where is that? When you pray to Jesus, what do you do? You say, Dear Jesus, and then your prayer, and then you sign it, and then where, where do you make it to? General delivery heaven? No. It's not going to get there <laughs> if it's general delivery. Because Jesus is in a very specific address in heaven, the second apartment, the most holy place. So I'm not saying that it won't get there, but it's going to go around the wrong, wrong route, you know? I mean, it'll eventually get there, but you don't want to take that chance. But he would pray in Jesus' name. Jesus takes to the greatness. What I'm saying is that he wants, he's looking for a people that will identify with where he's at and what he's doing. That is the only purpose of life today. That is the only purpose. Anything else that happens to you, bad, doesn't matter. You're dead. You're dead to self. And that's what the cross represents. The ultimate demonstration of dying to self. Even though he knew or did not have any assurance that he would be brought forth from it. When that becomes a reality in our lives, then the agenda of heaven will become our agenda. God bless you. Let's have prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for answering our request to meet with us through your Holy Spirit to not only give us an understanding intellectually, but a heart appreciation of what we have studied this morning. Help us to learn from Job, but help us to realize 
the point in time that we're at in history, which we have been for 172 years and one week as of today. Help us to learn that it is not your will for us to still be here, but that you cannot come back until you have, find a people that are willing to be made relevant for you. We ask these requests in Jesus' name and thank you, friends. Amen. Amen.